Linkmosis private Google Hangout. I've restarted it and hope we can get this working now. Let's see. If you would like to submit questions, you ought to be able to do that now, and I ought to see them on my screen. For whatever reason, I'm not seeing anybody requesting to join the Hangout on the bottom. I can show up to nine other people there, but I don't see that. Let's try another invite and see if that works. Well, y'all, people are saying they can see me, but it's like I can't see you guys, so I'm not sure what's going on. I can, you can see me, but I can't see you. Let's see, well, I'm going to try to figure this out. I apologize. We'll get it started. We'll get it going here sooner or later. You also can ask questions. I've enabled questions to be asked, but for whatever reason, I cannot hear you all, and my settings are all good. Bummer. Yeah, everything's set the way it's supposed to be. The chat box is there. The Q&A box is there. I see in my email inbox people saying that they're watching, but I need to figure out where I've got to go to be able to see you. Well, if you're there, the, and I can tell from the emails that I'm getting, um, Ed Harris, Marie Elwood, AJ, Kamesh, John, Mark, I can tell from my inbox, from my G Plus posts, that you guys are in fact participating. The problem I have is um, I want this to be a Q&A where you guys ask questions and then I'll answer them. So what I'm looking for now is uh, that page. There it is. Okay. Hey, Eric, you are on. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right. I'm assuming that you can see me, and I have found the place now. Thank goodness. I apologize to you all for that. Uh, um, I'll blame the uh, lack of sleep. Um, so I'm now able to see questions that are posted to me via Google+. Plus. Let me see if I can also see questions that are posted over on the screen. Okay, I hear you fine, Eric. Okay, so somebody, okay, that was John. Okay, anybody with any kind of questions. Uh, the other thing is I wanted to turn the audio on so that we could have that work so that I could hear you guys, and I thought it was on, but I don't see it on. Gosh, there's people on from Poland. Um, man, we got to try to figure this out. If anybody would like to at least uh, ask a question, I can try to start answering it. Because I see there's so many people here. But what I can't do is hear you. Oh, God. You can see here and feel everything. <laughs> okay. Eric, try opening plus uh, posts. Okay, I'm going to click that and let's see if that works. Oh my god, I see myself nine times. Yes, Kamesh, I agree with you. Your comment there about Google. I couldn't agree more. But unfortunately, that's not working either. What I want is the Hangout screen. I've seen every time I've been in a Hangout where I can see the faces of everybody, and it's not letting me see that. Doggone it. Hey John, uh, John Coffee, if you want, if you would, um, ask to pop in here on the bottom of the screen so that uh, we can see your webcam if you'd like. If not, that's cool. You don't have to. Man, we got people from everywhere. 
Nope, I cannot hear you all. I can't hear your voices. Um, and I've got everything turned up just uh, the way it needs to be to be able to. Anybody else out there? Okay. Ah, Eric Eng Engus past hangout had someone from Google help out. I see that. Okay. Uh, AJ, can you see questions here? Yes, I can see questions there. Uh, wherever it was that you typed that, feel free to type it there. Um, and I can toggle back and forth between that and the comments. There are comments for this over at YouTube. Bummer, I just want to be able to hear y'all's voices. Anybody out there yet? I know you're there. If any of y'all want to talk, I'm just going to change my audio settings. Just change my speakers to my... Uh, I've got my speakers enabled, I've got my uh, mic enabled, I've got everything going here, so I'm very, very sorry that I can't hear your voices. I really uh, apologize uh, for this. I'm not quite sure why I can't hear your voices. I know you're participating. I know you can see me on the screen, but unfortunately I can't hear your voices, so um, we're good and it's straightforward from your profile page now, it says. Okay, well, um, unfortunately when I go to my, my uh, profile page where I am now, again, I can see you, but I can... Uh, I can see that there are 24 comments that have been made as recently as 1.10 p.m., but or the most recent one was actually from Kamesh at 1.19. You guys could ask questions there. The challenge is that I cannot hear it, so in other words, we won't have the nice back and forth with our voices like I had really hoped that, that we would get to do. I was hoping that we could rotate rotate some people in and out and actually see each other. That was the thing that I missed last time was um, just uh, speaking, but uh, okay, John just dropped me another post. Yeah, that's actually what I've got open now, but I'll go ahead and I'll try it. Okay. No, unfortunately, it's not there. On my Google Plus page, it does say Eric Ward is answering questions live. Ask a question. If you would like to do that, that would be cool, but you're going to have to type it. And I'll refresh it now and see if we've got anything there. In fact, if any of you, after you finish cursing my name, want to give me a quick tip on if you think there's something I'm missing on the audio that would then allow me to hear all of you. It's not like we've got so many people that it would be overwhelming. I would just like to figure out how to get the sound working. My mic's, my sound's working. It shows it's working in my settings. I can hear my test uh, sounds in my headset. So, man, I just want to be able to hear y'all's voices. Okay, somebody asked, uh, okay, we'll start here, and if someone has some advice on how um, to uh, uh, get the sound going, that would be awesome, but let's start with the first question that somebody has dropped to me over in the Q&A box over on 
the uh, Hangout side uh, of the screen there. Eric, I'd like to know what you think about just linking to a website from small blogs and writing websites. It works great so far for my local small business customers, but I keep worrying if it'll get me in trouble later. Again, I'd like to know what you think about linking to a website from small blogs and writing websites. It works great so far for my local small business. Um, I think the, the key thing there is you say that it's working great so far, and that's fine. Um, if you ultimately control all of those blogs, if you control all of that content, you have to be aware that there is the potential that there will come a time when Google might detect that and choose to devalue it. I know that that, that, that works because um, I've had a lot of clients employ that themselves. I mean, it's basically their own little miniature uh, blog network. Um, and you can set those up. But ultimately, the other thing is, is it's almost like you have to continue to keep doing that. You've got to keep setting up more blogs, new blogs. Uh, otherwise, all your, at some point, you're going to create that footprint. You know, it's almost like uh, uh, if, um, you know, imagine that you continue that strategy and in six months, you've got all of these posts that are only on those blogs. So I don't know that you're ever looking at a penalty for something like that. But my hunch is the downside is a, a devaluation of the overall link profile because it was based too heavily upon content that you own. Um, so feel free to ask a follow-up question as I move on to the next one. OK, somebody just said, we're good, and it's straightforward from your profile page now. Awesome. OK, working fine. Greetings from Ohio. Hi, and it's cold here, too. It's 32 degrees here this morning. My kids didn't want to go to school. I had to drive. Our school is that way a mile, half a mile, and they, I had to drive them to school today because they were that cold. It was 31 degrees today, which is rare for Knoxville. Eric, I'd like to know what you think about, okay, that was the same question. Let's find another one. Um, Takeaway from PubCon Vegas. Well, um, as many of you all know, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Google fan. I like what they're trying to do with the web. I've got many friends that work for Google, spoken with many of them at conferences. Some of you have seen me on panels with Matt Cutts, um, and you know that uh, um, I'm ve vehemently against trying to un manipulate Google's rankings, especially for content that, that many people might argue but doesn't deserve it. But I think the main takeaway I took, it seemed like Google was almost the overwhelmingly dominant uh, undertone or undercurrent about PubCon in a way that I have never seen at previous conferences. I mean, certainly Google rankings are in incredibly important, but I don't know if it's because of the recency of the Hummingbird algorithm, the fact that they've been in the news recently for um, um, basically outing press releases and, and anchor text links and press releases, if it has to do with uh, uh, the issue of them also coming out publicly and talking about how uh, guest post blogs and especially keyword rich anchor text within guest blog posts could potentially cause you trouble. See, the issue with so many of these things is there are right ways to go about them and there are wrong ways to go about them. There is no possible way that you can sit here and tell me that any guest blogging strategy is bad. It's just not true. Um, there are, uh, uh, I mean, I write for Search Engine Land, Search Engine Watch, Click Z, Marketing Profs, or have written for a Search Engine Journal, Ad Age. Um, technically, they're guest posts, they're guest, they're guest articles, guest columns, so in what way are they any different? Um, man, I've been writing for Danny for so many years. I've, I've probably got 150 or 200 quote guest articles at uh, uh, other search engine mark and marketing related blogs, but that doesn't worry me or trouble me because of the credibility and the clout that all of those sites have. Nor am I going to stop. Now I will say that I would be hesitant right now to begin a new, a new guest posting strategy at a new site just because I know that as I'm hosting, as we're going about this hangout at this time, um, Google's got a group of people working heavily on trying to identify guest posts which cannot be trusted. In other words, guest posts with manipulative intent, whether it's their anchor text or whatever it might be. So anyway, the overwhelming takeaways that I took from PubCon is it seems like people are um, recognizing that Google has basically 
basically taken the gloves off and is going full bore and attacking whatever it believes to be an attempt to manipulate its rankings in favor of content that might not provide a good user experience. So it seemed like the whole thing was about Google. Um, then again, because of the nature of my business, content publicity, uh, publicity linking strategies, so much of the feedback and comments that I got uh, from the sessions were related to that. But man, I can't ever, really can't ever remember where it seemed like the actions of one particular entity uh, so dominated the, the discourse and conversation. Uh, let me move on to the next question that we've got here. Um, not directly a link question. Oh, wait a minute. There's, I've got to answer this just because Larry I think is so annoyed with me. <laughs> I'm not afraid to answer and be annoyed with me. Eric, wait, let me use it, what I assume this is Larry's voice would be. Eric, damn it. You promised us the video three months ago. I'm sorry, but any update on that video you promised us three months ago? Okay, Larry. I think that Larry's talking about that mysterious video that I promised about advanced Google search parameters. In other words, some of those, I don't want to call them secret tricks, but the ways I go about surfacing content and linking targets uh, that are a little bit unusual that that uh, couple together often two, three, four, five, six different Google advanced search parameters uh, that will help uh, um, steer you toward or surface for you uh, good targets for uh, linking pursuits, whether it's straight links uh, for organic search rank, whether it's links for, for content publicity or what have you. Larry, I promise you I will work on that um, and uh, I'd do a screen share and get it and do it right now, but I don't think that'd be fair to everybody else. Um, of course, it actually might be a worthwhile Google Hangout to do is to do a screen share and to show show them to you live so that you can actually see when I do some that don't work and how I adjust them or tweak them a little bit um, so that they do work. Just prior to this Hangout, I had a call with a, a company where we spent a big chunk of the call uh, going through what the exact uh, advanced search techniques could be for their link prospecting. So Larry, first of all, let me apologize because I did in fact say it would come soon. At the same time, for the, the those of you, and hopefully most of you are paid subscribers, I'm sure there's some of you that aren't, um, uh, I've got uh, um, um, uh, some scenarios going on here at home with uh, health related to family that have kind of kept me from being able to do some of the things I wanted to, but it's coming, I promise. Um, Let's see. You're welcome. Uh, and and I promise I'll make that the most awesome video that I've ever done. In uh, my, by the way, in seven days. What is it? October twenty fifth. In seven days, I'll celebrate the start of year nineteen as a content publicist. That's pretty scary that I'm still here after all these years, rather than basking in the sun on a beach, but that's what happens when you're a one-person business. Okay, so next question. So for any guest post needs to have the link back to the post and not in a SIG at the bottom? Ah, interesting question. Okay, so you guest post for somebody and instead of having the classic footprint giveaway right there at the top of the post where your subject line is, you know, 85,000 new ways to manipulate Google. A guest post written by so-and-so. Um, I do wish that the word guest post didn't appear so much on websites. I also wish that websites that seek guest writers wouldn't say write for us. I mean, to me, it seems like it would be fairly trivial for any search engine to write uh, into their algorithm something that can identify websites that say write for us and blog posts that say guest blog because it's simply another potential signal along the way that might help Google detect that, which is good and bad. I mean, in other words, there's plenty of legitimate reasons that you would guest post for a site. For me, on a guest post opportunity is, would I still want to produce that content for another site, even if I knew for a fact I would get no organic search rank credit? In other words, factor the search engines out of the equation. and no going into it, say, okay, I'm not going to get any search benefit from this. 
And if you can still say, yes, I want to write that guest post because I like the audience on that site. I like the people that are reading it. I like the credibility that that website has within the vertical, within its, its uh, business uh, uh, um, vertical, then absolutely write the post. Um, again, I don't think you want to let di Google dictate whether or not you choose a particular um, uh, uh, white hat or, or legitimate strategy. In other words, don't avoid an opportunity that could be fantastic for click traffic or for your business in other ways just because there is no, um, oh, there are no followed links. What good is guest posting for them? They're going to no follow everything. I don't care. I mean, if the site has 3,000 readers a day and they're the type of readers who might be interested in what I do, I'm going to write for them. You know, so I think that um, as far as specific to the question, is it better to have guest post by at the top of your post versus at the bottom of the post have a bio? This post was written by so and so. I don't know that it really matters because both leave a footprint. I mean, every single article that I write for Search Engine Land for Danny um, or uh, says doesn't say guest writer, but at the bottom, you know, it says Eric Ward. I mean, it's pretty obvious I don't work for Search Engine Land, so I think there's a footprint there anyway. So I don't know that that's one that either one is necessarily better or worse than the other. Uh, let's take a look at the le uh, next question. Um, okay, not directly a link question. Google is talking more and more about user experience. This is asked by Matt. Do you think that factors such as second search and long click, short click now play a direct part into ranking? Um, great question. Easiest, uh, real quick kind of uh, um, explanation just in case. I, most of you probably get what he's saying there, but you do a search, you click on the first result, it doesn't answer your question, so you click back, and instead of clicking another link, you do another. You type in another search. So um, Google now sees your behavior as person did a search, person clicked a link, person clicked back, person typed another search. From that, does that then mean to Google they didn't get what they were hoping to get from that uh, initial result? Therefore, when someone types those keywords. We're not going. We're going to lower that result because user experience is starting to, to indicate that it's not a good result. I think the one potential. Well, it's not just one, but uh, um, you know, the, just for what it's worth, the way I go about evaluating these types of questions or strategies or whatever is, I always pretend that I run a search engine, and based upon what I feel to be true about what I've learned over decades <laughs> of doing this is what would I want my search engine to be able to do and evaluate and credit and not credit? What signals would matter to me? Okay, so in this particular case, to what extent do I want to trust user behavior? Could their first search that they typed have just been poorly typed, poorly executed? So they came back and typed a better search. Um, could it be manipulated? Could I go out and hire 5,000 people to purposely do a search on a phrase that I know the site that ranks first or second or third is going to come up and click on that search and then immediately click the back button and click another search so that I'm sending this large collection of data that says, hey, that link that I clicked wasn't a good search result. In other words, one of the signals I would look at from my perspective is, is that manipulable? Is there something in there that could lend itself to possibly sparking negative SEO? Um, and man, there is negative SEO going on. I mean, my inbox is filled with people who, are, who have been victimized by it, or are certain they have been. Some are wrong, some aren't. Um, so I do believe, though, that Google is looking at user behavior when they interact with Google search box and with Google search results. Uh, to get a better sense of whether or not they're providing the best possible experience for the searcher. Um, I don't know that I would myself let that dictate um, any kind of content changes to my uh, site's content strategies or my link building. Next question. Let's take a look.
what are your thoughts on Hummingbird and SSL, Secure Sockets Layer, and how do you think SEOs should adapt to these changes? Um, Got to be careful here because I annoyed some people with the article I wrote for Search Engine Land last week or the week before. Uh, uh, six ways hummingbird could affect linking, link building. And if you read through that article, you would have noticed that very few of the things I mentioned actually had to do with the actual process of going out and pursuing links. Um, mostly, what I said is, or, or the the way I feel that hummingbird has the potential to affect all of us is if in fact, and we can't know this to be true, we can only go based on the feedback that we're getting thus far from trustworthy sources, whether it's somebody from Google or if you don't trust that, other people in the profession, is that Google wants to answer questions. Um, and Google would prefer to answer those questions if it feels it's the best answer without you having to leave Google.com. The example I used in my article, and that any of you could do right now, I don't want to do a screen share. Ah, I could try a screen share. I don't want to break it, but let's, let's hope that I don't break it. Here we go. Screen share. I want to share this screen and then I'm going to open a screen, and I'm going to do a search, and I hope you're seeing this. I assume you're seeing this. Are you seeing this? Hold on. Now let's do it again. Screen share. Yes, you're seeing it. Peyton? Eric Ward misspelling. Peyton Manning st Sorry. It'd be funny if it was different now than it was last week after my article. Okay. I just did a search on Peyton Manning stats. I'm still at google.com here. You're seeing a little bit of what some people might call I don't know if it's correct or not, but call it knowledge graph info. In other words, I got a little mini bio here, Wikipedia. I got birth dates. I got other information about him. And Peyton Manning stats, I got everything I need from this season and then for his career. And if that's what I was looking for, man, I just got everything I needed and I never left Google. That's, to some extent, where Hummingbird could potentially come. I mean, you can do the best job you ha you can of trying to provide Q question and answer related kind of content, solve problems for people, give them answers. But if Google has decided that it's something that they have the answers for themselves, I mean, I'm going to scroll down now. I'm hoping that you're seeing this. Kind of makes me feel bad for ProFootballReference.com or for NFL.com Peyton Manning career stats or ESPN.com Peyton Manning stats. You know, look at all of the U.S. I mean, how many sites down here have got Peyton Manning's freaking stats? It doesn't matter. They're not getting clicks. Why? Google just gave me what we needed. So I think that's one of the great challenges here is that um, Google is basically, in certain instances, going to answer the questions for us. Let me get rid of that shared window. I don't want to share a window anymore. Okay, back to me. Um, so anyway, that's a change. Be, it, what there because remember back in the early days, and even not that long ago, Google would you you we all viewed Google as go to Google, type what we're looking for, click a link, move onward, get our answer. Now, it's kind of like Yahoo went through and. Um, for a long period of time. I mean, everybody thought of Google as basically a quarterback, no pun intended with the Peyton Manning reference earlier, but you did a search at Yahoo, and with their directory, you would then be presented with directory results that you were supposed to click and leave Yahoo. At Google now, we're starting to see similar types of behavior in that if Google can potentially answer your question, well, why send you somewhere else? So that's going to impact a lot of sites that no matter what they do, I think that you kind of have to look at it from the perspective of if Google has targeted that vertical as one it feels that it can provide a useful answer without having to send somebody elsewhere 
especially if it's above the scroll. I don't have to, if I get the answer I want and I don't have to touch my mouse wheel or whatever, or flick my iPad down, uh, then it's very challenging for anybody who works in SEO to beat that. Um, and uh, I'd love to tell you that there's a way to solve it, but based on what we're seeing from Google, um, I don't know that there is. If Google decides it wants to answer questions for people, then all of the other websites out there that help answer those questions for people might need to be looking for other channels of traffic for those questions. Let's look at the next question. I can't resist. <laughs> I can't resist. Um, does Tennessee have any chance of beating Alabama tomorrow? This is the best answer I can give you. No. No chance in the world. See, that's the conflicted Tennessee Vol fan and graduate in me. And also speaking as somebody who was actually in the stadium in the mid-90s when we broke a 14-game losing streak and who did storm the field and who did take down the goalpost and walked it down Cumberland Avenue and walked straight into the old college inn and helped them mount it on the wall, yes, that would have been me. Thank God mugshots didn't exist back in the 80s because the entire group I was along with, I think it was, it let us go, but man, when you haven't beaten Alabama in 14 years, a disorderly conduct is nothing. I mean, shoot, give me that. I'll take that. The next time we beat it, we beat Alabama tomorrow and I'll get a disorderly conduct that you can tweet about. Okay, onward, questions. The role of content publicists is becoming an exercise in PR. Well, first of all, I don't, don't use the word exercise. That sounds painful. Do you see PR agencies warming to this new role, or to what extent are PR agencies becoming beginning to collaborate with SEOs and digital marketing agencies? Man, you want to talk about a question that's really going to get me fired up. Um, lean in uh, to that question. The I'm going to read it again. The role of what time is it? One to one forty-seven. Okay, we got time. The role of the content publicist is becoming an exercise in public relations. Do you see PR agencies warming to this new role? Or to what extent are PR agencies beginning to collaborate with SEOs and digital marketing agencies? Oh, man. For any of you who have seen me speak at conferences for, you know, since the early 1800s, whoever of you listened to my presentation on the Titanic, um, I've been saying since day one, and, and this, you can back this up probably just with a Google search, link building is public relations, when you're talking about representing high quality content, introducing it to somebody new who you do not know in hopes that they will then give you a link to that content, feature that content, write about that content. Man, I'll give you a classic great example from when I first started. Yahoo used to have this thing called Yahoo Picks of the Week. Now this is before there was a Google, so you didn't seek that accolade or that selection because you were interested in organic search rank. InfoSeq, Lycos, Hotbot, Webcrawler, and all the other search engines of the day were not going to rank you higher just because you were a Yahoo Pick of the Week. There were eight or ten editors at Yahoo Pick of the Week. The primary editor, his, first, his name was Adrian, and um, I had, fortunately, his email address. So when I would do a new launch for a website, you know, for some of my early clients, some of the, you know, cool sites that got online for the first time, whether it was Weather Channel or... Um, this was after Amazon.com, but uh, uh, um, the first Times Square webcam, weather.com, uh, readersdigest.com, uh, Planet Science, a New Scientist magazine, and I would submit those to Yahoo Picks of the Week. I'm basically sending an email to somebody in hopes that they will do something for me. I'm ho and they know what that something is. They know I'm contacting them because I've got a website and I want them to feature it as a Yahoo Pick of the Week because that could mean 10,000 visits a day or more for every day of that week that that site was featured as a Yahoo Pick of the Week. It was considered like a golden get when you were a Yahoo Pick of the Week. Well, that is so fundamentally a public relations activity. Contacting somebody, asking them to take a look at a website in hopes that they might then, if they felt it was worthy, feature it to literally millions or hundreds of thousands of readers. I mean, at its core, the idea of getting somebody to do something for you in, the, in this formal link has a very strong public relations component to it. I think personally that the SEO 
side of content publicity kind of appropriated link building, not by on a purpose. It wasn't like there was some great um, conspiracy that said SEO people will take over link building. I don't think it was that at all. I think that it was just that so few people really understood the nature of what link building was about. And since Google said links help search rank, then people in the corporate world said, well, if links help search rank, then it's related to SEO, so throw that over at the SEO guys. Um, when the reality is link building probably would have been better served by a joint or a collective task force that, uh, within the corporate environment that involved public relations folks, that involved pure SEO folks, your editorial team, and even your IT team. Um, all of them play a role in making sure that your content is the most easily linkable, shareable, migratable, so that it has the greatest possible chance to reach the audience for which it was intended. So man, I'll talk that till I'm blue in the face. Link The relationship of link building and public relations. Man, if I could find one of my business cards somewhere, hold on, if I get lucky. Shoot, no business cards. Um, my business card says, link building realist content publicist. I've always thought of myself as a content publicist. I don't build links. That's just what the industry decided to call it. I help content get known to an audience that I think it w that will care about it. And what they choose to do with it is then up to them. Certainly, a link is one of the things I hope that they'll do with them. But I could care less whether that link helps at Google. Another, you know, so they throw throwback Friday story was working on content related to John Wayne. Um, a cable TV network had uh, uh, launched a month-long series of uh, the best mo the, the films of John Wayne. They built online companion content uh, on the online uh, on the website that was the companion for their uh, um, movie classics cable network. Um, I did some outreach. Actually, went to Yahoo. Where I found it was in Yahoo Groups. I did a search at Yahoo Groups on John Wayne fans, and I found many John Wayne fan groups, some with thousands of members. Um, found the members, the, the John Wayne fan group's owner's email address, because it was easy to do, because it said list owner, and I sent them email, introduced myself, told them what I was doing, who I was representing, and that there was new content about John Wayne. And I got email back from him where not only did he announce that to his thousand members and share that URL with them, and remember, these aren't search rank URLs. This is going into a private discussion list. but. He said to me in his email, by the way, I'm also the president of the national chat, the national John Wayne fan club. We don't have an online presence, but we do have a newsletter that goes to 6,500 people. And that was like, holy, you couldn't ask for better publicity than for him to feature that URL in a print newsletter going to 6,500 John Wayne fans. You know, so... The heck with search rank on that. I mean, so much of the ethos of where I started and what I believe in today has to do with the more you forget Google in your linking strategies, the more you're going to end up appealing to Google with the types of links you're going to end up getting. So anyway, moving on. Sorry it took so long. Um, let's see the next question. Okay. Can't resist. I already answered that one. Jim Roth. Is, I'm sorry. Jim R. Eric, is responsive web design going to be a fair ranking factor in the future? 40% of my visitors are now tablet or phone, and my site is not responsive now. Well, Jim, don't worry about it. My site is not responsive now either. In fact, if there was a pop-up window that gave warnings, my website, when loaded in an iPhone, would probably say, please turn back now. Um, the, the way I would pose my answer would be there will come a day when, I mean, the, the web has a way of solving problems for you. The best example I can give you is if your site's hosted with WordPress as its CMS, well, you have the option right there of being able to render the site so that it's appropriate for whatever device the user is using when they're on that site. Um, so that your content is responsive. I load it on my iPhone. You know, the, content, you know, the content I load on my iPhone right now, well, hold on a second. You know, if I type in 
if I type in search engine land right here, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to torture you, but I'm going to do it and I'll try to do it fast. Um, and I'll talk while I do it. Do I believe that responsive design matters today? Absolutely not. Do I believe that there may come a time when it matters? Maybe. Okay, I'm now loading searchengineland.com in my iPhone. I'm going to wait for it to load. Watch it be wrong and try to. No, I'm sorry. Search Engine Journal. Okay, that's Search Engine Journal's mobile website. Let me do it so that there's no glare. Obviously optimized for the iPad, iPhone. Yeah, man. Okay, so you could say that's responsive design, but they didn't. The only thing that made it responsive was their choice of CMS platform on that. Um, taking that question a step further, if Google has two sites that it feels are a good answer for a question, does the site, and it, the question was asked by somebody on an iPad or a, a, um, a tablet or a, uh, um, an Android device, a Google tablet, will it rank the site with responsive design above the site that doesn't have responsive design just because of that one single solitary factor? I hope not. The reason I hope not is there are some absolutely passionate, awesome content creators out there who don't know shit about developing that. Excuse my language. I'll try to edit that if I can figure that out. Um, but there is, um, in, in some ways, it's like there's no way you can penalize people who are at, if I'm the world's foremost authority on the mating habits of the Smoky Mountain brown bat, and I, sadly, blog about it, um, but I know nothing about responsive design, and I didn't pick a theme that rendered for uh, mobile devices. Does Google really want to penalize me when my backlink profile shows that I've got links from every bat-related society, foundation, association, fan club, whatever, in the, on the planet? I mean, to me, again, I go back to if this was my search engine, would I want that to be a factor? Today, no. I can't predict what will come in the future, but my hunch is, even if it does come, what will happen is there will be tools that will help us to not have to know and not have to manage 87 different versions of our website depending on what the device is that somebody may be used to be looking at that content. I mean, the web has a way of doing that. Of, uh, well, take WordPress. You know, WordPress came out, but it wasn't particularly op well optimized for SEO, so you had to figure out how to do that yourself. No, you didn't. The genius that is Yoast of Auk solved the problem for you with his SEO plugin. I mean, if you're running WordPress and you're not running his plugin, that's a big fail. You've got to. That's the absolute. You know, that's the the very their very first thing on your list of to-dos if you've selected WordPress as your content management system. Okay, let's go to the next question. What time have we got? We've got 1:58. We got plenty of time. Yes, we are seeing it. Cool. You saw the screen share. Okay. Next question is from John P. We have an e-commerce website. We have been very successful in getting links to our free resources pages and to our homepage. But how do we then pass this link juice? Link juice? Link juice? I didn't think there was any such thing as link juice. That's what Matt Cutts keeps saying. There is no such thing as link juice. Why don't we call it, um, oh, how about um, link salve, <laughs> link bomb, link ointment. Um, how do we pass this link juice to get our product pages to rank in Google? Is there something else we should be doing? Um, gee, is it obvious I'm self-conscious about the glasses? This is what happens when you stare at a monitor for 18 years. I have perfect vision. And I can see, actually, that UFO outside my window right now perfectly. Um, it's just from three feet in, I can't see anything. Um, let me go back real quick. I don't want to be a bearer of bad news. There's only so much you can do to try to flow whatever value there is uh, to product pages. Um, excuse me, from your own site. You can do some. I mean, I've done it myself where I've experimented with trying to take high power or, or high, 
sites that seem to have Google's favor based upon where they rank in the search results and then place links on those pages to interior pages of my site in hopes of probably uh, trying to get those sites to rank higher and I've seen it work which tells me that there is the potential to rank, self rank take your own content and help it to push up and improve the rankings of your own interior content however to what extent you can do that with a product page is going to be dependent upon a number of variables first of all do you have 5,000 products or do you have 50 or do you have five um, if you've got 5,000 product pages you're probably not going to be able to do anything to significantly raise the rankings of those product pages to the point where it's going to impact conversions. But if you've only got five products, there's probably, and again, this is one of those things where sometimes I really need to see the website and the current layout and the link profile pointing to the website and the various pages in there to be able to say, okay, this is how we start trying to consolidate some of this link equity so that it has the most maximum effect on your website. Yes, it can be done. If somebody tells you we can't, they're wrong. Um, I know so because I've tested it myself on my own properties and on other websites. Um, you can improve your own rank with your own site only. How far you can take it, there's no way to say that it's an equal amount across all websites. It's going to vary depending upon a lot of factors. Um, you know, the Library of Congress, for example, at its page rank 8 or 9, can probably self-rank whatever it wants. EricWord.com probably can't self-rank a page about Skippy Peanut Butter tomorrow. You know, by tomorrow. Now I can self rank a page about if I pick a particular link building topic. Well, let's throw out the chance here that I might absolutely fail miserably. I'm going to create content optimized around the phrase link linking strategy Google Hangout or linking uh, link building Google Hangout. I don't have a page that says that right now anywhere on my site. I've never created one. I'll create one and I'll link to it from my home page or from some of my other powerful pages and I'll see if I can surface my new page solely with my own link. Um, my hunch is within a couple weeks it will. How high it'll get, we'll find out. I've taken some pages to position one. In fact, well, I don't want to show you because somebody might try to poach it. Um, but I've, I've made sites rank at position one. I've made sites jump hundreds of thousands of pages with nothing more than creating a landing page and linking to it for my own content. So it can be done. But with product pages, the question that you've asked here in the chat box, um, there is no stand pat answer. It's going to depend on how many product pages you have, how much you've, uh, link equity uh, is helping the other pages on your site. There is the potential. You might have to just pick a certain handful of products and try to steer things toward those and those only. But yeah, it can be done, absolutely. Um, is there something else you should be doing? Yeah. Um, again, I need to see the website, so I can only give you a generic kind of solution that I've worked with many clients over the past, and that is sometimes with an e-commerce site, there is a tendency for you to organize the structure of your site around product types or around pricing or around things that make more sense for you than they do for the end users. Um, let me try to see. I don't want to give a, a client example because I don't want to violate anything. I don't want to potentially offend or do harm there. But um, okay, let's say okay, not a client. Um, Bass Pro Shops. Um, most of you are probably familiar with Bass Pro Shops. Uh, Bass Pro Shops organizes and divides their products typically in a certain way. You know, whether it's men's, women's, um, boots, shoes, uh, hunting, whatever, fishing, whatever it may be. It's around product type. Um, sometimes what makes more sense is to have a secondary organization to your product type and organize it around interest areas that people are passionate about and have already created web content about. Um, you know, what's another example? Uh, you know, there's people that uh, um, there's people that love to go um, camping, but their camping isn't centered around 
fishing or hunting or hiking. They're going camping at a place where they can do some rock climbing. Or they're going camping at a place where they know they can do some caving. Spelunking, I guess, was the word back then. I was a lad. We called it spelunking. Not caving. Anyway, um, so why not organize, why not go through your SKU numbers of all of your 800 billion products that you've got at Bass Pro Shops and every single one of them that would be more likely to be purchased by somebody who was a climber or a caver was now organized in a new section, product categories by interest or passion, whatever you want to call it, man. Because why would you do that? Because I can now take you to Google and I can do some advanced Google searches and I can find you caving clubs, caving societies, caving associations all over the country that have got websites. I can find you rock climbing uh, clubs, associations, groups, enthusiasts. I can find you that kind of stuff all over the social web, on the, on the regular web, on, on, on a number of different places. And when you come to them as Bass Pro Shops, and you're trying, could you link to BassProShops.com? Well, no, why would I link to that? I don't fish, because that's what you know, a lot of people who don't, might first of all think. They don't necessarily think, when I think, when I think for myself, rock climbing supplies, that's not the first place I think. I got some. So, or caving, or whatever. So what I'm saying is, if you've got a, a URL now, BassProShops.com slash products by interest slash caving, You've just given, and then on that page is nothing but your products about that particular product line that serve that particular pa uh, pub population that's passionate about that. You've just given me something. If I run one of those websites about, you know, if, I've, if I'm the, the operator of the Knoxville Caving Club website, you just gave me something to link to that you didn't have for me to link to and I wouldn't have linked to before. So sometimes with e-commerce sites, it's the challenge is less oh, let's guest blog and have every guest blog post to be about the awesomeness of our products. Or let's pay for links and hope we don't get caught. Or whatever it might be. Sometimes it's as simple as let's reorganize our products around passionate content creators who are already out there. I learned this many years ago when I did a project for Volkswagen America. Um, there are so many Volkswagen enthusiasts web and club websites. Go online right now and do a search on any city and Volkswagen club or Beetle club. Yeah, um, and they all have links pages. So um, when Volkswagen first relaunched the Beetle and then the Turbo Beetle back in the mid to late 90s, it was so unbelievably easy to go pick up links for their new uh, uh, Turbo Beetle website because there were already these existing websites everywhere with these Beetle enthusiasts who were collectors. Um, so that's the type of, you know, I always look at content from the standpoint of could this content be organized in such a way that it will be more likely to resonate with the passionate, with the passionate, um, and that can have such a positive impact on your success rate from link building. Okay, next question. Uh, um, okay, we've answered that one. Okay, there's here's a cool one. My product, my okay, this is from Kamesh G. My client sells unique medical equipment, but they don't publicize except on their own website. What should we do about such clients? We have a very limited budget to work with. Um, I guess the question, you know, for the, the flags for me that I see right off the bat here is you mentioned that the client sells unique products, okay? Is that genuinely unique? Nobody else sells them? Nobody else manufactures them? If that's the case, they must have been created for people who have a unique medical condition or medical problem. And if that's the case, there probably are groups out there um, or um, websites devoted to people who have that particular affliction or, or situation that would require them. Um, I'd want to do a little bit more research into that to see if I'm correct. Um, they don't publicize except for their own website. Well, to me, um, that, uh, um, and I don't mean any, any offense to you personally because I've said this about my site. I don't advertise. I've never spent one single solitary penny on advertising. And then people say, well, wait a minute. Is it a website advertising? Yeah, it is. It's available 24-7 to anyone who has the URL. So they say that they don't do any kind of publicity, but they do have a website. Now, you were hamstrung a little bit in that if you're saying that they don't believe in de devoting dollars to external marketing techniques to help generate awareness, excuse me, it's a little chilly, uh, generating awareness for, for um, 
their content than you are hamstrung and they and I probably want to know more about why the other thing you can do is you can share with them the success that their competitors have man nothing can open eyes more than going to somebody and showing them the link profile and some extremely high quality link gets that they have that your client does not have whether or not that will convince them I can't say um, but you bring up a very challenging scenario basically you're saying I got a client who doesn't want to do anything what do I do you kind of help one of the things you have to do is educate the client you have to explain to them that um, as much as the search engines would love to tell you build great content and Kevin Costner and the rest of the people will come from Field of Dreams. You, I mean, I've always thought that was, you know, the overused yet incredibly accurate metaphor. Build it, and they will come. It's like if I was remaking that movie, it would be, build it, and buy links, and then they will come. Um, build it and spam. So there, the, you can't just build it and hope they will come. You've, there's a lot of different things that that might go into. There, there's that they may have some options. I'd have to see the site. Drop me a URL, I'll take a look and potentially maybe I can come up with something that they can do. But I, I think what I'm curious about is why. Why do they have this um, reticence, this uh, uh, belief that they don't have to do this? Hold on, let me see the bottom of that question real quick again. Tough challenge. What should we do about such clients? We have limited budget to work with. Uh, I don't know if it's going to have a whole lot of effect. I know that Google seems to really love Pinterest right now, so if you're after organic search traffic, one thing you might do is go out to Pinterest and see if there are people with pin boards related to un unique or unusual medical devices, medical supplies that are not competitors, and see if you can possibly push some of your content to those people. Make it easy for your stuff to possibly be shared. That's an that, that's a, a recommendation I would make for every single person out here today is reduce the friction that it takes for people to take your content and push it to other people. Biggest change in my career from 1994 to today is that when I started, people couldn't really share link. They could bookmark links, but the best you could hope for in terms of sharing links was there'd be a form on the website that says, send this URL to a friend. And you click the button and there'd be 700 form fields and that would be the deal breaker. You wouldn't fill it out and send it to a friend. Um, nowadays, everybody's a link builder. They just don't think of themselves that way. Almost everybody's on Facebook or Twitter or what have you, so make sure that you're giving people ample opportunities throughout your content to help your URLs via that one quick click, that impulsive click to push that URL across thousands who then can retweet to thousands more. To Keep your website free of the social sharing functionality is an absolute massive blunder. And some people say, well, why would anybody share my content? I sell grain silos in Iowa. And it's like, well, believe it or not, they won't share it if you don't give them the chance to because, well, I won't say that. It's just that it's a deal breaker. That's why I talk about friction. If you have an enabled shareability, I got to go up to my browser window, click new tab, go to Twitter, go back to your tab, copy and paste your URL, paste it up in Twitter. Okay, I'm now at 15 seconds in. Deal breaker. Whereas if you had given me that Twitter button that I could click and in two seconds I'm done and back on with what I was doing, I'll share it. So I think that's one of the biggest misses I continually see. Consulting call after consulting call all week long. I probably do five to seven consulting calls a week. Every one of those consulting calls has, in my opinion, not maximized the potential shareability of their content by making it easy and reducing the friction for that. Um, okay, next question from Stephen S. If you were launching a brand new site in a competitive vertical with established players, what would be your strategy for safe link building on a budget? Mm. Um, I'm not going to say that this is the answer in your scenario, but just to reread it before I answer, you're launching a new site in a competitive niche that has established players. What's going to be your link building strategy? Um, sometimes the best strategy is don't do it. Um, I had some clients call for a consulting call. Uh, 
they wanted to get into or they already had launched a website in the wedding favors industry. Um, you know, invitations, decorations, all of those little things for the wedding favors industry. And they were a husband and wife team and they were sourcing from third parties. And they had put together a very attractive e-commerce site. The problem that I had to unfortunately share with them was that they were, and you guys may know some of the, these, I won't say the names, but I mean, there are some absolutely famous people who have made millions in that particular vertical and written books about him. Uh, names you would know if I said them. So in that particular situation, knowing who they were up against, my recommendation for them was find something that you're more passionate about than wedding favors. Because no matter how awesome a job you do, if I work for you for free as a link builder for the next year, we will probably not even penetrate the top 10 that are ranking for that phrase because of the incredible competitiveness and savviness of the people who are already in it. Now I know that wasn't the answer you wanted to hear, but I'm going to give you a straight answer because that is the right answer, or that you know that is an honest answer. Um, at the same time, let's say you decide I'm the hell with it. I'm going to go forward anyway. I want to try this to compete in this vertical. First place I start is pull every backlink I can possibly get that every one of the competitors in the top 20 to 30 results have. Um, for word keywords that matter to me. I'm not saying this because I'm going to develop a keyword strategy or because I am now going to go chase every single link they have. These are only pieces of the puzzle. I want to see what they've accomplished links wise, publicity wise so far. I want to detect who's playing black hat because that can be found in a linking strategy or, or a backlink um, analytics profile fairly easily. You know, you can see that. Um, I can tell when I can spot the spammer in a spreadsheet, in an Excel spreadsheet, fairly easily. Um, it's uh, amazing the things that a spreadsheet full of URLs will tell you if you know what to look for. And I think part of that is just accidental. I mean, for the first seven, eight years of my business, since there were no real tools to do this, I was just dumping backlink profiles into Excel. And I would just spend hours all day long staring at URLs, and I ended up learning a heck of a lot about them just by virtue, I mean, you can, easy things. You can determine who's got a significant trade show presence, whether they're sponsors, exhibitors, speakers, or what have you, because you look at a, a backlink profile and you find links to them on all these different trade shows. So it, that's going to be step one, study their backlink profiles. And part of that is to find easy get links you can get that they've got. But you can't base your link strategy only on what they already have, because that means all you're doing is chasing them. They're ahead of you. You're finding their links and trying to chase you, chase them. Even in the most perfect scenario ever, all you can hope to do, imagine the perfect scenario comes to fruition. You have the same exact links they have because you followed their, their, what they were doing. Well, all you've done is pull even. You haven't surpassed them. And likely they were there first, so because Google does seem to have a tendency to favor old sites, they win. So you can't base your linking strategy only on what others have. Um, as for what the next strategy is going to be, it's going to depend on the vertical. It's going to depend on how savvy your content creators are. It's going to depend on your budget. Um, it's going to depend on your willingness and how much time you want to spend to put into this. Because the reality is you could put a heck of a lot into this, yet not succeed. But ultimately, the thing that would allow you to win would be is if you latch on to or find that which they cannot themselves replicate. Because remember, if all you do is go out and get yourself a new batch of links that they don't have, well, they'll just find those when they run their backlink analysis and discover what you're up to. Um, there are so many aspects about link building that are so transparent to your competitors that I'm a big fan of what I call stealth linking. There are linking strategies you can use that your competitors will not even know that you are using. These are not strategies that are going to help organic search rank, but they will help your click traffic, and they will keep your competitors from knowing what you're up to. Um, and some of those are extremely fun and creative and uh, keep me still wanting to work in this field uh, um, after all these years. Okay, thanks for answering my questions. Uh, let me see if you're launched. Okay. I can't, can you...
Okay. What if you have been to some awesome place and you blogged about that since you didn't use right keywords and don't rank top, how can mom and pop feature in top rankings for that place review? Hmm. I'm assuming when you say some awesome place, you mean like a destination, whether it's a restaurant, a, a uh, um, travel uh, destination, or what have you, a famous landmark, or whatever. Uh, and you blogged about it. Okay, you've been to Mount Rushmore, let's say. You blogged about it, but you don't use the right keywords necessarily when you blog about it, so you're not going to rank in the top. How does a mom and pop? How does a mom and pop get featured in the top rankings for a review for that place? Well, the reality is they probably don't. It would depend on that mom and pop. You know, um, I'm mom and pop. I'm pop. I'm a one-person business. My website cost me all of 30 bucks to run. I break every single so-called SEO rule, yet I rank where I want to rank for the terms I want to rank for. Now, if I go out, about the only thing I would say I could hope to rank for is if I go to some awesome conference and I choose to blog about some link building session. I got a shot at that. But if I go visit the Smoky Mountains and I hike the trail up to Mount LeCant, and then I come back down here and I blog about the awesome time I had at Mount LeCant, I'm probably not going to rank because it's going to be the first piece of content ever on my website in 18 years that even mentioned Mount LeCant. I'd be very surprised if I ranked them. I might, it would be, but I would consider a mistake. I'm no authority on Mount LeCant. There's others who deserve to outrank me for that. Um, I don't know if that was the perfect answer to your question, but um, I hope it helped somewhat. I'm going to try, as we see, I've got just a handful of minutes here before I need to hop off uh, 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 to get to a few more. Um, okay, what is the best tool to find every backlink to a site? There isn't one. <laughs> um, there is no tool that knows every backlink to a site, not even Google. Um, now, the big players in this space, and no offense to any of them if I forget, if I ignore them, you know, Google Webmaster Tools, uh, Moz, formerly SEO Moz, Open Site Explorer, Majestic, AREFs, I, think, I don't know what happened to Blacko, I think they quit. Um, there are some others out there, and again, I don't mean to purposely leave you out, and it's not because I don't think that you offer a fantastic service. I think any data point and all data points you can get about your backlink profile are worth going after. Now, that's a lot of money because you've got to pay the monthly fee to subscribe to those services. However, what I've noticed is when I've done a, um, a consult with somebody who supplies me with all of that backlink data from all of those sources and wants me to evaluate their link profile and, and make recommendations on what to disavow, what where they see holes, where are competitors cheating, is it something they should be doing, you know, basically studying backlinks, literally hundreds of thousands of backlinks, and from that devising or defining a strategy from which to give them, the thing that I notice about all of them is the difference. I mean, it's truly shocking the lack of overlap, but here's why that happens. First of all, Google's got more money than any of them, billions of dollars at their disposal to create as many servers and as many server farms and as much storage capacity as they want, and they can crawl every single possible page of the web that they want to crawl. They can crawl more than anybody can. That's a fact. But they don't. Even Google makes decisions about what they will or won't crawl. And uh, if they, I can't remember what they've stated in public, but you can probably go find it. There are sites that they have, not in fact, not crawled. You know, uh, um, so even Google has to draw the line somewhere. Um, likewise, with uh, uh, Open Site Explorer, Majestic, Ares, Blecko, whoever it might be, so you have to make a decision about, first of all, your seed site, which sites you're going to crawl, how deep you're going to crawl those sites, when do you pull the plug, or when do you stop crawling. Uh, so by that very nature, it's just like, you know, you'll see ads for the world's biggest used car lots. They're not going to have the same inventory. The search engine indexes are not going to have the same inventory. Um, it's just the way it is. You know, uh, there never will. The web is growing too fast. Millions, if not billions, of new pages added a month. There's no way these bots are going to crawl all of them. That's why I think it makes sense to get all of them. As far as who is the most complete 
if you forced me to say who has the most complete data, the challenge with that is when I answer it, I don't necessarily know that it's the most useful data. Uh, because just because they're willing to throw the kitchen sink at you in terms of data, 800 billion backlinks doesn't mean that there's anything in there that might potentially be useful. You might find backlinks from forum posts you made in 1994. I could find those from some of the original listserv discussion lists that got ported out and archived on the web. Well, what good is me finding a backlink from a signature file in, a blog, in, in an email newsletter post I made in 1995? Doesn't help. No, no useful data there, no actionable data there. No, of no use. It just gets in my way and wastes time from something that's more important. So I'm not saying that the question isn't important. What I'm saying is I don't believe that I would hang my hat on one tool. I would want as many as I felt that I could afford. If you sat there and said I can only afford one, I'd probably say that if you're based in the States, go with Moz, Open Site Explorer. If you're based outside of the States, go with Majestic. Um, if you don't have a preference to, to either of those two, you know, try AREFs. You might try all of them using their 30 or 60 or 90 day trial period and see which one you like more. Um, I know that my preference, if someone is going to hire me to analyze all of, analyze their backlinks, is that I'm not thrilled when they have a very small data set because I just know how much more is out there that, that, I, that I'm not analyzing. You know, you give me 15,000 URLs when I think we work and we're both confident that there's probably three, four, five, maybe even ten times that your number of URLs out there, man, I really want access to those. I don't feel confident about what I'm going to tell you based upon that small sample set. Okay, moving on. I'm going to keep going. Okay, let's see what we have here. How do we find these stealth links? Um, what can I tell you? What can I tell you about stealth links so that I don't feel like I'm giving away secrets? One I wrote about. One I wrote about a while back. Um, had a client in uh, the Carolinas on the beach. His primary business was taking people out on day trips that wanted to do um, scuba diving to um, uh, shipwrecks. You know, uh, you know um, take them out for the day. They go and get to dive around a, a sunken ship. Um, maybe see some cool coral reefs and some cool sea life. Um, and then they come back up and um, drink a bunch of beers and tell all their, share all their stories and go back home happy. So this company specialized in doing these day trips for groups of people. Sometimes they knew each other. Sometimes they'd have a, a charter. Maybe it was a corporate charter where, you know, there were eight or ten guys from a company who all happened to be certified in scuba, so they wanted to do that. So the idea of stealth linking for him was to find uh, – I hope I don't feel like I'm giving away too much here. Go to the hotels in his coastal area that were not part of major chains, but who did accept reservations online, and who did send an email-based confirmation of the reservation. Now, when a reservation came through for whatever it was, you know, whether it was a family of five, an individual, when they chose their dates, you know, I'm going to, I want to stay at your hotel from June 1st to June 7th. Uh, want a suite, double king beds, these are the amenities I care about, here's my American Express card, and click, congratulations, you know, thank you for making your reservations, you will receive a confirmation email shortly with the various things you need to be aware of, please print that out and bring it with you. Um, now, they get the email in their inbox, and they know they got to print it, but as they're reading through it, and as they go through it line by line through that email, at the bottom of that email it says, depending upon your personal interests with, while you're staying with us, please feel free to avail yourself to any of the following offers that are exclusive to our property. 
say, 15% off a day-long scuba trip, courtesy of my client's name. And there's a link to his website right there. In an email confirmation from a hotel, none of that scuba guy's competitors are ever going to see that link. Well, unless they happen to click that. Um, stealth link. It's going to every single person who makes a reservation at that hotel. And there are links in there for him. There are links in there in that confirmation email for other for restaurants, for other destinations or other sightseeing tours, uh, or, or other types of destinations or venues. These are not links that have anything to do with organic search rank. This is link marketing at its finest. I call it stealth linking because you keep your competitor from knowing what you're up to. What's in it for the hotel? Well, there could potentially be a lot in it for the hotel. When somebody contacts the scuba guy first, he can ask them, have you found a place to stay yet? Stay at so-and-so hotel. I have an arrangement with them. They'll give you 5% off your room or whatever. I got coupons for you for after we're done at the end of the day. Um, if you want to go out to eat at a number of restaurants, I'll send you that coupon, you know, via email if you want it. In other words, these are, this is just marketing, man. This is marketing that ends up resulting in links in a place where nobody else is going to know about it but the two parties who have joined together to do this kind of marketing. I love brainstorming those kinds of linking strategies because they reduce your dependence on Google. They work. They develop relationships in your marketplace that can last for years. And other very cool things can come from them. Ongoing customers, repeat business, other stuff. So anyway, that's kind of a definition. How do you find your stealth links? It's going to depend upon your vertical, man, but they're going to probably be available for any vertical. If you want to go through that, I, I don't want to use this call to... Okay, I do want to use this call for more business. If you're a Link Moses private subscriber, you know you can get ex extremely discounted consulting. You might want to wait a week or two because going out of town this weekend, um, got some family stuff, uh, um, Halloween, and um, some other things going on, but my schedule is usually pretty booked for those calls, especially for the less expensive calls for the Link Moses private members. Um, and I'm doing some uh, um, ex ongoing training uh, with some clients too. So uh, there's a few open hours a week starting next week, um, and then uh, um, uh, we'll we'll see where it takes it takes me from there. But let's go. Um, oh man, awesome question. If a competitor's backlink profile shows, hold on, 233. If a competitor's backlink profile shows a black hat strategy, can I do anything about it? Is it an actionable piece of information? Absolutely actionable piece of information, um, but you've got to decide what you want to do with that information. First of all, what makes you think it's black hat? Can you be absolutely certain it's black hat? Um, usually you can't. I mean, I'm pretty good at spotting them, sometimes wrong, but for the most part you can kind of detect when somebody's up to no good. Is it actionable? Yeah, but what you got to be careful about is do you want to put in a spam complaint to Google? Um, what they want to see is a search result that they think is indicative of spam and you want to show them the search, re you give them the search result in the form of the query that produced the result, you tell them who shows up in the result that you think shouldn't be there, and you tell them why, and that's where you outline your evidence. Well, here's 57 different URLs that has paid links with exact match anchor text or whatever it might be. Um, whatever evidence you have that you can compile to, for, to make your case stronger, now, I'd be very careful about putting that in from a particular company that you compete with. I mean, in other words, you might want to put that in anonymously or through a different account that, I mean, um, that's dangerous stuff there. It can, it can come back to haunt you or end up with, you know, negative SEO wars, which sounds like it ought to be a good reality show. <laughs> It'd be better than some of the ones that are on there. Better than Honey Boo Boo. Honey Boo Boo goes negative SEO. I'd watch that. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's actionable. I've done some of those before for clients. You know, I, um, I mean, it's no secret that the guy, you know, that I'm 
close enough with the guys at the search engines on their spam teams because I've spoken with them enough at conferences. They know I'm white hat. They know the advice that I'm trying to give is designed to help quality content do what it needs to do to get discovered. I'm not going to help crappy content rank. I'm never going to do it. Um, so uh, assuming I even knew how to do it, I wouldn't do it. So anyway, yeah, it's actionable, and um, maybe I could help you with that, or you could do it on your own with the advice I just mentioned. Um, we have an e-com. Okay, John P. We have an e-commerce website. We have been successful in getting link. Okay, I already answered that one. I apologize. Any thoughts on local citations and on building links to the social citations? That's from Leslie G. Yeah, man, absolutely. Um, so uh, local SEO is um, easier, in my opinion than national SEO. In other words, Google is putting such an emphasis on, on local citations, and I say citations and signals because it's not all about links. Um, the best analogy that I can use, and I used it earlier, and I know it's kind of goofy, but I mean it makes sense. You know, Google has these bots that are canvassing the web, crawling the web, identifying links and URLs, checking to see if it's a new URL. Have we ever encountered this URL before? No? Okay, put it in our database or in our queue to crawl. Crawl the content whenever we can. Come back, look for more links. Have we found that link? Yes, ignore it. Well, when's the last time we found that link? Okay, crawl it. It's been a month or whatever. So, but, so Google's got these bloodhound kind of bots that are canvassing the web looking for new content. Based on that and the relationships and the links between this content, it's my belief that Google knows I live in Knoxville, Tennessee. I, my hunch is that the high caliber content of Knoxville, Tennessee can probably be summed up in a few thousand websites, a few hundred thousand pages. You know, you're going to have the newspapers, the TV stations, the radio stations, the alternative news weeklies. You're going to have the associations and the clubs and the societies. Um, you're going to have, uh, um, you'll have these in every city. You know, you're going to have the individual businesses who have great websites, crappy websites. Um, you're going to have the people on Facebook who are based in not. You're going to have the things that make up the fabric of the web that represents Knoxville, Tennessee. And Google can see that. Google can recognize that based upon the linking relationships that are found there. Whether it's starting at the major university's website and going through every different department and finding all the benefactors, donors, visiting the university, where to stay, where to rent a car. I mean, there alone you can probably find two or three hundred different websites that indicate quality and part of the fabric of Knoxville. Now go to those websites. Go to the Chamber of Commerce websites and just follow the membership roster. Go to the Better Business Bureau and do the same. I don't think it's a particularly difficult task for Google's mind, brain trust to weave the fabric of the quilt that is Knoxville on the web. Your job with local citations is you got to get yourself into that quilt. You got to find a way to infiltrate and get into the fabric that represents Knoxville on the web. What I mean by that is make sure first of all any possible NAP citation you could get. NAP means name, address, phone. Well actually it's kind of wrong nowadays. Call it NAP, NAP, NAP W, NAP what? Name, address, phone, and you are NAPU. Name, address, phone, URL. Because so many of these local citation sources now are asking for a URL. Um, and and I don't just mean the yellow page websites. What I'm talking about is it, I have a way that I go about what I call scoping a local link universe. Identifying that which Google already knows to be an important, trustworthy signal in any given city, in any given local market or whatever. Um, and then the question becomes, which of those can we find a way on to, do business with, whether it's an obvious link or a stealth link, forge a relationship or alliance with? What are some of the things we're overlooking? I can't tell you how many times I have asked a local client to give me a list of, or, or to write down a list of every single organization you have donated money to, donated services to, helped contribute to, hired an employee from, you know, all of those community outreach things. And sometimes I'll list 5, 10, 15, 20 different organizations that says, yeah, we've donated a bunch of money over the Yeah, and every Christmas we do this, so toys for tots and coats for the needy, and we give away bicycles in the spring, and 
at, at uh, you know, uh, we do a haunted house in Halloween or whatever it may be. That, and before you know it, they're sitting here remembering things that they didn't even realize they did every year. Then you go out and you look for those organizations that they're participating with and see if they have websites or a web presence or something on Facebook or whatever it may be. And oftentimes there was a link waiting to happen that just needed to be asked for. Sometimes these local organizations don't really realize the potency of the links. They'll have a page of sponsors, donors, contributors, and they'll have a link, a list of the companies that aren't even clickable links. I have had numerous times where I have suggested that you call those little local, you know, you donate 50 bucks a year to the, you know, the, the, the haunted house for the underprivileged kids, and they have a list of all their corporate donors, and unfortunately they're not clickable hyperlinks. But it wasn't on purpose. It's because the little haunted house website had no clue that, you know, call them and say, you know, if you would make those hyperlinks, I think you'd be shocked at how many more donations you'd get. In fact, here's how you do that. Let me help you. There's this false assumption that everybody understands HTML. If they have a website, they don't. There's this false assumption that everybody understands the potency and value of links. They don't. There's just so much more that you can do out there, I think, that people completely overlook. And in local, more so than anywhere right now, especially as the engines are turning their eyes more on local credibility, local signals of trust, local authority, man, I love advising on, corporate, on, on, uh, on local strategy. Okay, let's see what else. See what else is going on here. Okay, let me see what time it is. We've gone over, but that's okay. Cool. Uh, it's another local citation is considered important. Typically, I use Yelp, Manta, MapQuest, Foursquare, local pages, and 30 other. Yeah, that's fine, but you don't want to rely just upon these 800 pound gorilla sources that are aggregators like that. You've got to get out into the local marketplace and pick up some local links. You know, you got to get some links from some of those local businesses, local associations. You know, if you're a female-owned business and they're in Knoxville, and there is a Knoxville female-owned business club or society, you got to be a member. You know, you got to be involved with them. You got to get involved with them. You got to help teach them the value of what they ought to be doing on their website. You've got to again infiltrate in a positive way. Infiltrate, educate. Collaborate, you know, uh, do whatever it takes to get away from just the Yelps because the problem with those is you're at the mercy of whatever uh, uh, partnerships they can form. You know, it's like, okay, so Yelp might matter to Google today. Well, it only matters until Google says they're not working with Yelp anymore, if that ever happens. Um, I don't like putting all my eggs in these 800 pound gorilla baskets. Yeah, they're a piece of the puzzle, but man, again, my, my sweet spot, I don't know if I mentioned this or not. My sweet spot is I want less tra I want my traffic to continue to increase, my reliance on Google to decrease. In other words, my traffic is going up, my client base is coming up, but as a re but as a percentage of all traffic I get, less is coming from Google. Because that means I'm less reliant on the next uh, the next hummingbird. You know, the next one that comes up, you know, the vulture update. You know, that destroys whatever it destroys. I don't have I mean, if I brought up my analytics right now, I think I'm between seven and eight percent of my traffic. Five million page views a year, seven or eight percent from Google. I don't. If Google dies tomorrow, goes away, I still have ninety-three percent of my traffic. It's coming. You need a couple individual visits from thousands upon thousands of websites from the four people who day click my article, or one of my articles. So, I know Google's important, and Google has the potential to send you a fortune in revenue, and that's fine. I'm not saying don't pursue it. What I'm saying is because we're at the mercy, if you do that, you put yourself at the mercy of Google's algorithmic tweaks that you need to have a secondary or a, a, a other alternative linking strategies so that you're not so destroyed at the next Google update that might take aim at something you're doing. All right. Let's see if this is the last. That was the last question. Okay, it's now 2.45, so we've been going. I know we were delayed at the beginning, so we've done about an hour and a half. Again, this is recorded. It's going to be available on YouTube. Um, I do these, to be honest, because I know I haven't been able to publish as many issues this over this past month. Um, I had hoped to do far more. Uh, we had a significant health issue with my wife. She's better now, um, but it took me offline, and it was a, a, health, a significant scare there for a while. Um, but uh, uh, when you're a one-person business and that stuff happens, man, you log off and you go take care of business, and that's all I can do. So being able to do a thanks to Google's technology here, a Hangout, I, I want to do more of these. I don't know if I can do one a week or one every two weeks, but certainly one a month. 
um, I want to do whatever I can do to keep my subscribers. I am working on another issue. Hopefully, uh, over the weekend, I'll have it out for you. At eight bucks a month, no plans to ever raise that price. I hope that you might also help me continue to be able to do these by telling others to sign up for it. Um, I've been pleased with it, but at the same time, I think it has potential to have more subscribers uh, than it has. Uh, so, um, do me a favor. I don't know if I should ever do an affiliate because how do you? Does any at eight bucks? If you do an affiliate, does anybody really want a dollar? <laughs> so. Uh, um, but anything you can do to help add to my subscriber base will encourage me to keep doing these and other webinars. And um, thank you so much for joining me. Also, any of you, you know, if you can tell me what I did wrong and why I'm not seeing everybody's picture on the webcam at the bottom of my screen here, um, and how I could invite people in and show them on the screen so they could ask their question live rather than just via text, I would love that because sometimes it gets tough to just basically talk nonstop for an hour and 45 minutes. And um, again, thank you so much for your time. As far as the professional backdrop, um, I do that because, uh, well, I'll go ahead. It's like in The Wizard of Oz. It's like, what's behind the curtain? I'll show you. Behind the curtain is a ping pong table. Behind this curtain, a basketball set. So now you see that... Um, my famous Link Moses private office is actually set up to be for my three kids to play in. I don't have any local clients, and I do that on purpose because, God forbid, any of you actually appeared in my in my office, you would see what looks like a Toys R Us um, dumping ground. But again, um, thank you so much for attending. Uh, it'll be on YouTube. I hope you got some decent answers from it. If not, and you don't mind paying a few bucks, I'm here. Uh, I'm still. Uh, um, uh, uh, working toward uh, the retirement that will never come. Actually, right now, I'm working toward the uh, college for my three-year-old girl, Sophie, who, for whom I'll be like 67 when she starts college. She won't even want me to visit her at college. When I say, you want me to come for homecoming? She'll say, no, Dad, just stay home and like do another one of those hangouts and Photoshop it so you don't look like an old man. Um, thanks again, everybody. And until next time, this is Link Moses saying, I'm out.